My name is Dan Draw, and I'm a detective. I'd been investigating the story of pens, trying to discover where they came from. I'd found three clues. The first introduced me to cuneiform, the earliest kind of writing done by pressing on clay. The second clue brought me to reed pens, used in ancient Egypt to mark on papyrus. And the third clue led me to those fancy quill pens made from feathers. The story of pens was taking shape. Then a new clue showed up. A dip pen with a metal point. I went searching for answers. And so, Mr. Quash, what can you tell me about this? Yes, Detective Draw. Very interesting. Your trinket seems so small and insignificant. And yet, it has changed the history of the world. Which is why I must have it. Boys? <laughs> Oh hi! You know, there's nothing quite like a metal dip pen and ink to give an artist a controlled black line. That's why they've been the tool of choice for calligraphers, cartoonists, and other illustrators for generations. On our channel, we've been exploring the history of the pen, and in this episode, Chapter 2, we'll take a look at the metal dip pen and discover its part of the story. Welcome to Art Expedition. For over 1,200 years, the quill pen was the dominant writing instrument throughout much of the world. But quill pens require maintenance. When used, their points wear down and need to be sharpened. A person who wrote often could go through many quills. Thomas Jefferson kept a flock of geese just to make sure he didn't run out, a sort of waddling off a supply store. Quills could break and shatter. Limited availability of proper feathers meant that not everybody had access to quill pens or could afford them. There was a need for a pen that was strong, consistent, and inexpensive. Over the centuries, attempts had been made to create pens out of metal. Archaeologists have discovered copper pens dating back to the times of the Romans. While those pens were strong, their points were stiff. Their makers just didn't have the ability at that time to create a flexible metal point so important to writing and drawing. The metal pen was no match for the mighty quill. But that was about to change, all thanks to the Industrial Revolution. Beginning in the 1760s, advances in technology and manufacturing were changing the way things were being made. Products that were once handcrafted by a single person could be mass produced faster and cheaper with the aid of machines and a group of workers. The city of Birmingham, England had been at the center of a lot of that change. It had been a leader in the iron industry, producing metal goods of all kinds. Birmingham was the home of several inventors that played key roles in advancing the Industrial Revolution. It had a growing skilled workforce, as well as business owners who were willing to experiment and take risks. If any place could make a better pen, it was Birmingham. And in the early 19th century, several of its businessmen began to try. By the 1820s, people like Josiah Mason, John and William Mitchell, and Joseph Gillott had turned their knowledge of metals and manufacturing into making and selling pens. These pens consisted of a nib, the metal part that comes in contact with ink and paper, and a holder made of wood and other materials. The word nib comes from an old German word that means beak. The Birmingham entrepreneurs worked on the design of their pen nibs, continually trying to improve on what each other had done. This resulted in nibs that were thinner, stronger, and more flexible. New varieties became available for different purposes. They used machinery and mass production techniques, breaking down each part of the process of making a pen into individual jobs. This meant that they could make pens faster and less expensive. Initially, some people were reluctant to switch from quills to nibs. They thought that metal pens were too scratchy. But the quality of the metal pens got better and better. The prices of metal pens dropped lower and lower. 
Metal pens didn't need sharpening. They lasted much longer than quills, and even if they did break, they could be cheaply replaced. And they didn't rely on birds. <laughs> Sales quickly grew. The quill that had been so dominant for over 1,200 years was replaced by the metal pen in a generation. As the pen industry grew, new companies started up in other parts of the world. But Birmingham continued to be the center of pen making. At its peak, Birmingham had nearly 100 pen factories that employed around 8,000 people. Most of them couldn't read or write. About 70% of the workers were women, earning about seven shillings a week. Thanks to the hard work of those individuals, people around the world had access to pens. During this same time, a move for public education was growing in England and America. It had an emphasis on arithmetic, reading, and writing. Handwriting and penmanship became part of the new curriculum. More and more people could write for themselves. They could communicate with loved ones over distances through the writing of letters using metal pens. The metal pen was used in school classrooms across the United States but in other parts of the world. The growth of the pen industry also coincided with advances in engraving and printing. In the 1800s, a growing demand for pen-drawn illustrations in books, magazines, and newspapers created new opportunities for artists. Advertisers used pen-drawn illustrations to promote and sell goods. New art forms like comic strips and later comic books are born from creative minds all using a metal pen. Throughout the 20th century, the metal dip pen is the tool of choice for almost all cartoonists and comic book illustrators. Even today, with all the options available, artists of all kinds still turn to them. It can get messy, and it takes some practice, but the humble metal dip pen is still a great option for creating. Well, you've done it again, Detective Draw. You've cracked the case of the metal pen. Who knew that a little pen could have such an impact? No wonder they were after it. It'll be a long while before those characters cause any more mischief. But I feel like there's something more to this. We've returned the missing items to their owners, and one of them wanted me to give you this as a reward. It was another clue. Here we go again.